always a treat to welcome in TSN's Director of Scouting, Craig Button. I want to get to the present-day Jets, but you're wearing that Michigan shirt. Let me ask you first of all, Rucker McGrory. Um, he looked great at the tournament. He has been, I believe he was the player of the month uh, for uh, for last month. He's absolutely killing it at Michigan right now. Craig, what um, if Rucker McGrory signed with the Winnipeg Jets at the end of the season and came in, do you think he could be an impact player for the Winnipeg Jets at uh, at, at some point potentially in the postseason? Uh, I, I think it's always hard for a young player to come in and be an impact player. Do I think he could come in and 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 add some some attributes and elements? I, I do think he could do that. You know, the Winnipeg Jets have, in my view, have lots of impact players, and I think for a young player like McGrory to come in, I think that he could more than hold his own, and he's got an infectious enthusiasm about him and and, and a big time competitive spirit. So if you if you ask Rutger McGrory to go in and be the third goaltender in the morning skate. Uh, and, and and just stop shots. He would go in there and give it everything he's got, and, th and that's the, that, that's the type of person he is. You know, over time, and I, I'm very you know, I'm very open about this. I have a man crush on Rutger. Like I love him as a person. I love him as a as a hockey player. You and, and the whole city of Winnipeg. Is, yeah, yeah. Well, well, dude, I'm happy to be on that. I'm happy to be on the majority train. I really am because he he's a special person. And and he's a really really strong hockey player. And you know if you if you take all the individual things and you, you know he might not be in a skills competition in the All Star game, but when you're playing and you're trying to win, you want Rector McGrory on your side. I'm going to tell you who he reminds me of in terms of the, the impact that, that I think he'll eventually have. And if, if and, and I worked for him and, and he's a Hall of Famer, and I think Rutger will probably have a little bit more offense to him. But Bob Gainey is the player that I see Rutger being like to a team. The, the, the ability to change the course of a game, to will the game in your team's favor, to do things that are so impactful that don't show up always in the, in the stats column, but they show up in the win column. And I think that that's the type of approach. You know, having watched Rutger for so long now, and it, it feels like I've been watching him forever, but the continued development, I'm really comfortable staying that I think he could be like a Bob Gainey impact on, on, on a team. And I'll say it right now, I think he's an untouchable player. I know everybody talks about you got to give up something to, to get something. But unless you're getting a, a, a player that can have that type of impact in, 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 in right now, there's no way he I would trade Rutger McGordon. He is the untouchable player in my view. Well, and you just mentioned all those attributes that he brings. I mean, uh, and, and the energy that he brings. Um, I mean, I'd want that, even if it wasn't on the ice around my team in the playoffs. And uh, just quickly on record, I mean, it's now, you know, the second season since he's been drafted. I remember speaking with you and your excitement about Rucker and the pick when the Jets made it two years ago. How far has he come from when he was 18 hearing his name called to right now being on the cusp of turning pro at the end of the season? Well, I, I think he's progressed significantly and, and, you know, using your term, he's come so far and, and that's what you want to see from a young player. You, you draft a player at 18, you're projecting of what you think he can become. And certainly uh, the Jets, you know, loved Rutger McGordy. They saw lots of potential in him. And, and, and I'm going to bet that probably the, the Winnipeg Jets might be really impressed with how much his development ha has gone on. And, you know, I'll use an example you know, when we drafted Jerome McGinley back in 1995 with the Dallas Stars, we knew Jerome was going to be, when I say we knew, our belief was that Jerome would be a really good, strong NHL player, 30 goals, power forward, maybe 35 goals. Well, he far exceeded that. <laughs> so, you know, I can say that we were wrong in our projection about Jerome because he was a superstar. And we didn't project him as a superstar. We projected him as a really good, strong player on a team. And he became far more than that. And I think that that's for Rutger. I'm not I'm not comparing him to Jerome McGinley. I'm comparing it to the progression from the time he got drafted. And I don't think there's any doubt that in my mind that when he comes into the NHL, his impact will be significant on a team. And it, it'll be infectious, as you point out, about the, the, the enthusiasm. And, you know, you, you know the saying, no bad days. I, I, I don't think that Rutger has any bad days. I just, I, I've never seen him. I've been around him so much. I, I've never seen that. Even when he was having his injury, 
uh, recovery leading that into the World Junior. I mean, he was just zeroed right in on what he was going to do. The first game at the World Junior, he had, uh, I don't know what he got, he must have had about a half dozen chances. And he was just off a little bit, a little bit of the timing. And even after that game, he was like, no, nope, I'm okay. I'll, I'll, like, it feels good to be back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to score. I'm going to do the things I need to do. And, and of course he did. Well, we'll be following him throughout the rest of this season in Michigan, and then uh, and a lot of people uh, crossing their fingers that we might see him in Winnipeg <laughs> at some point later on this season. Um, someone that just, well, hasn't actually played a game yet here in Winnipeg but made his Jets debut was Sean Monaghan on Pittsburgh, Craig. Uh, what did you think about the acquisition of Monaghan and uh, what he brings to the Winnipeg Jets? I think it's a terrific acquisition for the Winnipeg Jets. I mean, they find themselves in a spot – at this point in the season is, is one of the best teams in the, in the National Hockey League. And certainly when you look at the way they played, you know, defensively, how deep they are, Sean just makes them deeper and stronger. And he's had, a, had an excellent season in Montreal. And when you when you consider how healthy Sean Monaghan is, you now see a player that can be productive. Sean Monaghan isn't the same player today that he was in Calgary, you know, earlier on in his career. But when you're bookended by Mark Scheifele and Adam Lowry, I think it's a perfect spot for Sean Monaghan. But he doesn't all he doesn't just have to be a bookend between those players. You can move Sean Monaghan around your lineup and for Rick Bonus to be able to have that flexibility with a player that, you know, on the ice, you, you know, you're never worried because he's a great faceoff player. You know, he's very conscientious defensively. He's good on the power play. He can play the wing. He can play with different players. And I think that adding all those attributes in Sean Monaghan's game to an already really good, strong, functioning team is nothing but positive, nothing but positive for uh, the Winnipeg Jets. And so, you know, people, oh, it's a first round draft pick. Well, I don't know if I've ever said this. I consider 21 to 50 all first round draft picks. Like, you know, like I can name, I can name 20 guys right now that I know are going to be first round draft picks. After that, I'm not as certain, I, you know, I can take this, but I really believe, and that's why teams, and you hear it all the time, you hear team, they drop the guy at 41. We can't believe he was there at 41. You know why? Because they rated him in the 20s. And then they, then that's how it works. And so uh, it, it's not a first round draft, like, well, it's a first round draft pick because that's, that's the first goal. But to me, the price to be a good team comes, uh, you know, with a price. And I don't think the price that the Winnipeg Jet, Jets paid for Sean Monaghan is anything that's prohibitive. It's anything that should be uh, uh, considered uh, unjust. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great move for a Winnipeg Jets team that has designs on going deep into the playoffs and contending. Craig, uh, uh, speaking of the upcoming deadline, there's been a lot of talk now that Monaghan is a Winnipeg Jets about Kevin Chevaldeau potentially uh, moving his focus to uh, an improvement on the blue line, and the name Chris Tanev's come up quite a bit. Uh, what do you think about a fit of Tanev with the Flames? And and from what you're hearing, what's it going to take to get Chris Tanev out of Calgary, considering the interest in him around the league? Well, you know, the Toronto media, who are really just Maple Leafs cheerleaders, you know, they're starting to try to, they're just trying, they're, they're starting to run the narrative that Chris Tanev isn't worth a second round draft pick, or he's only worth, you're not going to get more than a second round. Oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah, right. Okay. Listen, you, you're going for it, right? I mean, Ben Sherrod won for a first round draft pick. Uh, David Savard won for a first round draft pick. Don't start telling me that Chris Tanev isn't worth a second round draft, isn't worth a first round draft pick, because he's a really, really good player. You, you know, I, I talked about Rutger. Chris Tanev is, is that player that comes into your lineup and he is fully committed to doing whatever it takes to help your team win. Fully committed. He, he can play lots of minutes. He can play rugged minutes. He can play the heavy minutes. He can play against the other teams. And and, and when I look at, at the Winnipeg Jets, and I, I, and I think that me looking at their team and, and where they're at, I think uh, like an addition, some strength on the blue line that can ease some of the – some of the burden, number one on Josh Morrissey, number two off of DeMello and Pionk, who, who aren't bigger defensemen. You know, they they carry themselves. They got some weight. They're competitive. I think that that would really help that blue line. And you, you now have a really good, strong penalty killer. You have somebody that can match up hard against the other team's best players. And Chris Tanev doesn't give an inch to anybody. He, he, he's territorial. He's competitive and combative. And to me, that type of a player, when you're going into the playoffs and you want to strengthen that area of your team, and, and then that's your top two pairs of defense, I think Chris Tanup would be a terrific fit with the Winnipeg Jets. And certainly, and, and like, yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. And understanding that, 
you know, everybody's got, but there's no way that anybody's going to tell me he's not worth a first round draft pick. When I see Ben Sherratt and I see David Savard, to just name a couple of guys that, that got traded for first round draft picks, go for that price. There's just no way. And again, you, you want to be serious about winning. Don't tell me what the cost is. Tell me, are you prepared to pay it? And, and that's a simple yes or no. Because the price, when your team is really good and your team has a chance to really push itself forward, the price of not doing something is far greater than the price to, that you might have to pay to get that player or players. Craig Button with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Um, Craig, last week, and you knew it was going to happen at some point, the Jets were going to have to expose, in all likelihood, one of their young defensemen, Declan Chisholm, got plucked off the waiver wire for Minnesota. And now Brendan Dillon is suspended. Now, for tonight's game number one, um, Logan Stanley's been with the team. He's going to be in the lineup. Um, many people, myself included, think in the near future, we're probably going to see Billy Hanel at some point. Um, assuming there's no additions to the blue line or until that happens, what do you think the best course for the Jets is to get Billy in and get him into the lineup, considering how well he played in camp, the fact that he probably won a spot in the opening lineup and then missed half a season with that ankle injury and is now playing with the Manitoba Moose. How do they bring him in and what makes the most sense considering how well the six ahead of Logan Stanley in the depth chart have played so far this year, looking at the goals against numbers? Well, I mean, one of the best defensive teams in the league. I mean, there's no question about it. And certainly, you know, Declan Chisholm, he played two games for the Winnipeg Jets. They couldn't get him in the lineup because the players were just saying, like, you can't take us out. We're playing too well. And and I, I think that's a real credit to, to the six blue liners that have really carried the load. And, and you know, Nate Schmidt, it was it with a healthy scratch a couple of times. And Logan Stanley, you know, had his spots out of the lineup, some of it because of injury, some of it because he just couldn't get in the lineup. And, and to your point, Billy was having a fantastic preseason he he looked like he, he looked sturdier he looked really more confident in, in his defending ability and ironically just an unfortunate injury defending hard like like he was showing that he was capable of doing so I, I guess the silver lining here is for the Winnipeg Jets in, in in the immediate future the three games Brendan Dillon is out you've lost Declan Chisholm is that if, if, if Billy is able to get in there now and start you know trying to look it's a good opportunity to get him in there get his feet wet you know you're you're giving him that opportunity to try to find his way in the lineup. You're not unseating somebody to get him in there. And I don't know what his state of readiness is to come into the in there, but but if he is ready now, I'd get him in there right away. I'd get him in there right now playing and, and, and get his feet wet and then see where he's going. I mean, I'm not splitting up. I'm just not splitting up 44-2. Like, you know, I don't think you have to do that. You know, now with Brendan Dillon out of the lineup, it's going to be interesting. You know, what do you do with with, with Neil Pionk? Do you want Hanola and Pionk to play together? You know, certainly Sandberg has been a, a really good, strong player for the Winnipeg Jets this year. You know, I, I, I might be inclined to play Pionk and Stanley together and then have Hanola play with Sandberg because, because Dillon's been so steady in his play this year if if, if, if Billy's able to come back in there and play and, 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 and his readiness dictates that he's ready to play. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to fall. I mean, I, I think for many of us, we don't need to get down the inconsistency of NHL player safety, but um, I think we thought it might be one game or two games. Well, now that it's three games, it does give them that chance. And the team's going to be coming home from Philly after this game. I think a lot of people would love to see Billy get a chance potentially Saturday against the Pittsburgh Penguins. And I guess from his perspective, Craig, knowing how important his next time in the lineup is, uh, it's a matter of going in, showing everything that he did in training camp and giving Rick Bonus uh, a very, very difficult decision to take him out of the lineup when opportunity presents itself. Coaches will tell you, you know, at, at these points in time, you know, that this is a good problem to have to have too many good defensemen, right? Doesn't make the decisions any easier, but those are decisions you want to, you want to be able to have. And certainly, you know, the, the, if, if Billy can find that form coming back from, from that ankle injury, it will only help uh, the Winnipeg Jets going forward. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to dive in here. I'm going to dive in here on, uh, on the suspension to Brendan Dillon. On November 30th in a game versus the Edmonton Oilers, T.S. Janmark absolutely hammered Josh Morrissey in the head on an interference call that I said on the broadcast should have been a two-game suspension. 
They didn't even give him a suspension. They didn't even give him a fine. And now when I see the Brendan Dillon play, that's the inconsistencies that people look at from the Department of Player Safety and go, what? I was like, I, I know that not every play is the same, but how could Matthias Janmark not get suspended for that? And then Brendan Dillon gets three games. And I'm not saying that Brendan Dillon didn't deserve to be suspended, but to me, it's the inconsistencies that get themselves the criticism that, that comes their way. The Dillon play was was really strange in that yeah. I mean, when you look at it back, I mean, Achari at one point kind of reminds me of one of those speed skaters, you know, where they put both of their hands behind oh. their, their head and just like lean right in head first. I mean, it certainly didn't look like Dylan was intending to do it or head hunting. Um, and, and you don't see, or you certainly didn't see that five, six, seven years ago in the league of guys leading with their head like that uh, when they're entering into the zone. Like, I'm not really too sure how much he could have done. Listen, when you see the guy's helmet fly off and he gets hurt, obviously there's going to be a call from NHL player safety. But I'll admit, Craig, I was, I was stunned considering what we've seen for other things, certainly involving the Winnipeg Jets and get us going on that with Hartman and all that, that <laughs> Brendan Dillon all of a sudden is the guy that's getting a three-gamer when you look at what they've done so far in other, maybe not totally similar situations, but with what three games has been given for this year. I totally agree. And that's why I said, again, I was right in the building for that Edmonton game on November 30th. And, and geez, yeah, I mean, it was complete interference. It was complete head contact. I mean, Josh Morrissey had to leave because of concussion protocol. The spotters could have minded the game, and it was a really tight competitive game, as as we know. But to me, that like, and 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 again, like, I, I don't think players, you know, for the most part, are going out and trying to attend. To, like, in fact, I, you know, intend. Things happen in the course of a game, and you got to be in control. And Matthias Janmark was completely not in control. And and I agree with you on on the Brendan Dillon thing. It's like, okay, you know, what what's the responsibility? I'm not I'm not here to blame any victim whatsoever. You know, you look at it. What could have Brendan Dillon be doing differently? But the inconsistency in the application of the the the, the number of games suspended just just puzzles me. It puzzles me. I don't know what else to say, Craig. Uh... Going into the break, uh, the Jets, some of the goals really dried up. And I think it's not a coincidence that Mark Shifley was out of the lineup. Coming back from the break, Shifley's in and I thought looked really good. Monaghan had some nice shifts with Ehlers and Perfetti. Uh, but they got shut out by the Penguins. And there is, I would say, there's a little bit of nervousness considering what's happened in the second half of seasons before. Can you... Uh, can you calm the nerves of Jet fans? I mean, uh, should they be worried right now? I mean, uh, where do you think this team is at? And and looking ahead to this next game tonight, game Saturday, in these next few weeks, what do the Winnipeg Jets need to do to uh, get back to their winning ways? I'll try my best to, uh, you know, try to alleviate the fears of Jets fans because I, I, I see this team as very different. And even before the break, I, I, I thought that they were – you know they lose they lose one nothing in overtime in Toronto. I thought that Winnipeg was the better team, and certainly Samson Sonoff played excellent on the on the return game. I thought Winnipeg played really well. Sam Sonoff again was was a real significant difference maker, and and certainly when when you score one goal in two games, you know that you, you're it's hard to win games. So so you got to find a way to score defensively. This is one of the best teams in the league, and I, and they're still not giving up very much. It, it would be one thing if, if you're floundering in, in an area of your strength and that's falling off. And certainly, you know, the record, what, what they did, two goals or less for that stretch, three goals or less for over 30 games. I mean, it was it was beyond impressive. And that's not going to carry through, you know, like, like it, it's hard to carry that through for 20 games, let alone 30 plus. What I see now is is, is a team that, that that is still committed, and and this is what I like about the Jets. They're still committed, and and we hear this all the time. We're going to play to our identity. They're going to play to the things that give them strength, and and that's what I continue to see for the Winnipeg Jets. Even against Pittsburgh on Tuesday night, I thought that they were they were committed. They were playing. Yes, they had some good chances. They weren't able to bury it. And Tristan Jari deserves some credit for that too. I mean, the goaltender gets in the way. But, you know, you, you try to find a way. Last year when they were struggling and they went into their struggles, they weren't getting chances. Like the, the offense dried up because they weren't getting chances. The defense was vulnerable because they were creating their vulnerabilities. I don't see that in this little stretch here. So until I start to see signs of that, 
And I don't think I'm going to because I think that this team is very different. Mark Shifley coming back after the injury and after the break. It's going to be a hard game in Philadelphia on Thursday night. But Philadelphia is a hard team. But I think the Winnipeg Jets are a hard team. And I think that all the things that they've done so well to find themselves in the position they are in the National Hockey League and in the Western Conference are things that are going to serve them well. So I don't see any reason. I know when you start to have some – losses and they and they start to stretch a little bit more you start to go, oh boy is this is this a sign i don't see signs of of a team that's going to dip yes they got to find a way to score and, and and that has to be the objective right now but they're getting their chances and they haven't moved away from the identity and the strengths of what got them to this point